Right, I'm going to, hi folks, I'm going to share my screen. So I'm in Scotland, in um, Edinburgh, and yeah, I lead a centre called Design Informatics, which is, well, it's, it, it is what it says, actually. It's, it's an institute which is across, hang on, I'm just going to make sure I'm in the keynote, and I'll go, go big, Chris, go big. There, I think you can see that. Can someone just confirm, because I can't see a thing anymore. Is that... We can see it. Oh, great. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to put a timer on. Sorry, I do the timer as well. Yeah, so I lead a centre called Design Informatics, and um, ultimately it is part of a design school, but it works within and also part of the School of Informatics. Um, so in some ways, uh, Design Informatics is part process. Informatics is the study of the flow of information, but we're very in design. So we have a gallery and an event space where we want people to engage in informatics, which might range from AI, ML, NLP, all these um, acronyms to talk about data-driven technology, to a design studio where people, you'll see socially distanced, can work with uh, 3D printers and Arduino to develop um, prototypes. But in some ways it's interaction design, but it's also very keen to prioritize this human data interaction as opposed to human computer interaction it wants to start itself, understand itself being connected to, to informatics, the study of the flow of data. And excuse the drone view. We had a drone in because, of course, everyone was kicked out of the buildings. So it's been nice to um, play with those technologies. Um, yeah, we've been involved in uh, distributed ledger technologies, blockchains in different forms um, through a series of grants. And some of these are led by the EPSERC, which is an engineering physical research, ca uh, research council in the UK, but also the economic and social research councils, because they're all involved. And at the bottom, you'll even see the arts humanities. So all of us are interested in how value is represented. And I think it's the value as a concept, which ultimately designers are fascinated in. We're all involved in the co-creation of value. Designers are really good at that. And when you then begin to explore a technology like blockchain, you really understand that value can come in many, many different forms. And actually, beyond money or beyond crude forms of ledgers, where they're perhaps centralized, you begin to see that value could be co-constructed, co-created, negotiated, and ultimately represented in many, many different ways. And it's that journey that we've really enjoyed. And, it's, um, and blockchain has certainly provoked a whole bunch of new questions about how we represent values and just an insight to the team really we i have to work with colleagues and i, I have to for my own um, um kind of sense of um, logic you've got to involve many different people from ethicists to data visualizers through to hci folk as well as designers so but let's get on to the core business what i'm going to do is show you two um oh i've got an echo there so Whoever's got their microphones on, um, please drop those. Uh, I'm going to show you two things. We, we, we work with blockchain across two forms. Workshops, which are participatory based workshops um, to allow people and us to understand what they want to do with blockchain or what it is, but also for us to learn how people want to use it. I don't think in, 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 the, in the spirit of co-creation, we don't want to own what the technology does. We want to learn and we, we learn through workshops. And then a whole bunch of prototypes. And I'll show you how we've worked with partners on the outside to think about speculative technologies that might roll out and help us understand how blockchain might change aspects of society. Um, so I'll, I'll stay with the green for a minute and I'll scamper through the workshop phases. Way back in, it doesn't seem as far back as Alan's work on this, but in 2014, where we got wind of uh, Bitcoin and blockchain. Um, and began to start developing a workshop methodology called block exchange. Now, you'll see on the right, really, it's quite a crude way of helping everybody who is just not familiar with blockchain to understand how you build and seal these particular blocks. So on the right, you can see three tiers of Lego. Each tier is a sealed block. And after about a period of 10 minutes, after some cryptography, crude analog cryptography has taken place, People within the workshop are literally trading these bricks as though they were transactions recorded onto this particular blockchain. And you can even see the tiny little stickers which have initials to demonstrate that they're uh, co-authoring and inscribing their relationships across those. And then ultimately they move through this and it's a highly collaborative. And we've worked with lots of people from the banks who we thought would know best 
but they need people like designers to help unpack what blockchain is for many of the other partners in their um in their communities so it's 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 been a good journey more recently we've had to flip it online so we even have a miro version of it now and i'm surprised it it works very well it ultimately leads you go through this onion really the first layer is unpacking the process of the blockchain through lego but ultimately at the core of this onion as you peel back the layers of functionality on a blockchain we end up with well if if the smart people understand what we've done, then we encourage them to design an ICO, um, an initial coin offering, which sounds a bit 2017, but it's very helpful seeing them. What does this do? Because it changes governance of business models. Um, the second one is very playful. In 2016, we started to work with Electrum. Electrum was a um, we don't use it anymore, but it allowed us to move wallets around. It's a wallet management application and we it allowed us to move wallets onto GPS coordinates. So here in Amsterdam 2016, you begin to see that I've applied three types of wallet which perform smart contracts. If I, and I'm given a wallet through the browser, um, I move into the same GPS coordinates as those black lumps of Bitcoin, I literally, or the code, moves the Bitcoin from a wallet in the street into my personal wallet, um, a simple smart contract. If, however, I move into the area of the green, what happens there is I will be given fractions of Bitcoin so long as I spend time within those GPS coordinates. So very, very simple smart contracting. If I move into the red area and if you look at the bridge, things get more hostile because I have to move over that bridge very fast. So long as I spend time in that particular red area, I will be fined uh, by the second. But it's an introduction to smart contracts and applying um, and giving GPS coordinates um, wallets um, then led to this, well, we called it Geocoin, and um, it ran from Electrum, which was clunky, into Ethereum, and now we run it through a web app, but we've stripped away the back end, so it's no longer on chain at all. Um, but it does allow, as a workshop methodology, people to understand the principles between very simple smart contracting. If Chris and Chris's GPS coordinates enter these particular GPS coordinates, then enact a, um, a series of um, rules and it's the passage of money and my balance goes up and down. What was interesting though from these and just a clue into what happens when you bring um, participants to these experiences, this is a group of urban designers, they used the Electrum model and they decided in their story that Amsterdam City Council would move a whole bunch of local cryptocurrencies into a geocoin platform and it allows people to vote so here, instead of being perceived as being fined, what's happened is a member of the community is reallocating funds in the, from the ledger into funding particular things. So really, it's participatory budgeting. This person here has been given some crypto. They can't take it out. It's, it's, it's protected. Um, but what they can do is allocate where that money goes. So on the ground, they're literally voting to allocate these particular places with money. Um, or what they can do is press the piggy bank at the top and they can instantiate a new place that they think needs funds. And other members of the community can walk into that area and allocate their personal allocation of funds. Um, and these things all lead to um, something that we begin to think about as new economic imaginaries. These are members, and I'll zoom forward here, um, these are members of Tesco Bank who have very locked in ideas of what money is and what value is. And beginning to help them understand that maybe if data is more likely to be a currency in the future, data actually allows you to store values. And it's the values that data can store which ch suddenly changes the representation of value. Here what they're doing, and I won't dwell on it, but they're moving through the streets. So this is a design workshop. They've, been, they've decided to remodel cinema ticketing. Now, you won't see a cinema in the video, but what they're doing is using Geocoin to remodel the business model of cinema ticking so it becomes more participatory if you think about it tick, cinema ticketing is pretty crude you buy a ticket at one price it enters this proposition and then you leave it's a very 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 limited ticket model and they've got a far more participatory model where people come in and come out if you take away your litter you get you get credited if you tweet around some of the trailers you get credited so we're curious about how these new representations of value allow us to design 
or revisit business models from old services. And again, we had to flip it into um, a Miro. So we now do Miro. Geocoin and, and the students travel out into the world when it's safe with their own smartphones, but they come back and perform and enact those rule bases within a Miro board. So, oh, good fun. And the last one is, I won't dwell on this too much, it gets a bit more complicated. Um, some of the things we got particularly interested in is self-sovereignty. Uh, this idea that if we really want a decentralised um, population, and the UK isn't, it's a very, a very centralised imaginary. We still believe state is at the core of survey things. And I do like the idea of decentralising power. But to do that, you're going to have to encourage people to take responsibility of data and develop self-sovereign identities. And here we have something called Pizza Block, where we perform and enact a type of blockchain that, in well, it places more responsibility on people. They have passports where they get stamps um, to demonstrate that they're gathering expertise and those are then recorded in the ledger. But it's a lot more work for people. And um, you can see people thinking, crikey, decentralization, that's going to need, need more work. And, and that's useful in terms of discussing the benefits. And then finally, we're just doing some work now in developing um, kind of like the geocoin, really, helping people write simple smart contracts through a very visual contract builder that then will talk to Solidity behind it, which allows us then to enact those across Ethereum. So again, just trying to break down the, the user experiences um, within this place. OK, so on to uh, the blue area, which is the prototyping, really. And just to scamper through some of these, um, we've done a whole bunch of and we really enjoy it as designers spending time with people in workshops and then flipping it into speculative prototypes. Most of our prototypes do work, but of course, they're very low on the TRL, on the technology readiness ladder. You really wouldn't want to roll these out to the public. The first one is the Bit Barista. So it's um, a Lavazza coffee machine we bought from eBay but we augmented it with a Raspberry Pi. We gave it its own Bitcoin wallet, so it's able to buy coffee beans from internet uh, providers, but it wants to do it according to your values. So here the question is, the, the value proposition is what you want the coffee machine to do to buy the next type of coffee beans, cheap coffee beans, environmental coffee beans, socially responsible coffee beans, um, this is uh, Rory who developed, so he's going to make a choice now about the type of beans he'd like to vote for, for the machine to buy. Now, he's a scumbag, so he's unfortunately going to choose the best price. I tried to encourage him to choose the low environmental impact or the best social responsibility, but it always fails and he goes for the best price. But what you'll see is after buying the, uh, the coffee machine with his Bitcoin and it dispensing it, you'll see, and I'll better pause it, there's a moment here when the coffee machine after X amount of coffee cups, I mean, it's sold 204, it then makes a call when the coffee beans have run out and it says, well, hey, office, Rory, you lost out because actually the office has voted that I, the machine, buy socially responsible coffee beans. So then it goes off and buys a bag from an internet supplier. But it proved quite productive and the BBC um, featured it as a way to demonstrate how autonomous economic agents might increasingly enter society, begin to start taking the, the social ethical load away from us, allowing things to guide some of our values, which um, proved interesting. Um, another piece is this is work for the EU Policy Lab around blockchain. They have a whole bunch of uh, European ministers, MPs, um, who don't really understand the benefits of anything we're talking about this morning. Um, so we developed a series of prototype hair dryers for them. The first one, and I should say, this is all in the context of a decentralised energy grid. We were given energy as a problem to solve. Um, what might life in a decentralised energy uh, economy look like? So here, this is a student. He gets up at four in the morning, because uh, he can, to essentially buy cheap energy um, on his local grid. And he'll buy it at a low price. And what he does then, on a Thursday or Friday night, when you're all going dancing, he will then sell that back to the grid and he'll make money, which essentially means he's not paying for the energy, which is fine. But um, those his values are about um, the t ability he can get up in the more uh, early in the morning and he wants the money benefit. He wants the kickback. On the other hand, this one is where you instill the same 
activity, instead of a student getting up, you ask a robot to do the work. So a piece of software is going out into the world to do that trading. But here you can start adding your values. So here, Sean may well have said, I'd like green energy. I only want green energy. The bot goes off. It might take two minutes to find green energy on the local grid. But if it does, it then guarantees that he blow dries his hair. Yes, he's still paying for it, but he's blowing drying his hair with it with the values that he'd like to associate with that data, that smart contract. And then the last one, um, I won't spend it too long, is that ultimately we don't trust humans. We don't trust any of you to make any social, ecological, responsible decision. I'm really sorry. And we could talk about this later, but we took the buttons away. We tend to find that humans like buttons and you'll always turn on the power. Here we've taken the button away. So the bot takes over. This hairdryer will only turn on when there is an appropriate amount of energy in the grid for you to blow dry your hair. And in this, Sean will be waiting a very, very long time to blow dry his hair. But ultimately, the bot makes the decision in the interests of all of us. Um, what else have we done? We've also, we took some of the ideas from the GeoCoin and we've been marrying people on the blockchain. Um, this is in the Edinburgh Festivals a few years ago. And we've um, essentially, you could probably see there are two iPhones left and right. They're in the same GPS coordinates, which allows us to fulfill a marriage contract. And that marriage contract, take, it's only five minutes, but it was placed within the block to the Bitcoin blockchain. So a little bit of gas, a little Bitcoin was used to fire up and document it. And it was quite interesting, some quite stressful moments for young people to think about, will you marry me for five minutes? And they would look at us and we say, look, this isn't, well, it's going into the blockchain, but it's not legally binding. Trust us. But because it was immutably placed within the blockchain, people became very nervous. And as artists, we like these moments about questions of immu immutability. And then we, we, we married a father to his youngest daughter, which amongst some people in the community felt was, uh, was a wicked thing to do. But we don't mind. Again, we're creatives trying to talk about what, who sets the rules, who sets governance, and what does it mean to have things immutable in uh, the Catholic Church blockchain or just our little blockchain. And it doesn't really matter. They're conversation pointers. Um, and then moving on to the last project, which um, with a few minutes to go, I'll just talk about. This is the one we've just finished. It's called Oxchain. It's basically blockchain for the large charity called Oxfam, which you might have heard of. They do British based, but they have international work across the planet. And we worked with the um, uh, the Australian um, Ox, uh, Oxfam department. But I'm going to play this little video first because it sets the scene of what designers do. What you're looking at here are a series of physical smart contracts. The first one is the lifeboat launcher. If you put money, and it's, I'm just going to read out the contract essentially, and that these particular devices are listening all the time. If money enters here, you put it into this, essentially into an escrow, no one can get their hands on it. If a lifeboat launches, and look, there's been a lifeboat launch at Kinghorn in Fife, then the cog will turn and it will donate money to the lifeboat, the RNLI in the UK. So these are very simple design manifestations, physical smart contracts. Uh, I think this one, uh, the next one is based on tweets. If you write a hashtag up here and you put money into the escrow at the top every time, the Raspberry Pi behind spots that that uh, hashtag has been used, it literally uses moves money into that pot. And they're just smart contracts, right? Very, very simple. But the physicality and the design of these has helped a whole bunch of communities understand what we do next. So we design these little backgrounds and then more recently we deployed it into an app. So now you're looking at an app that was deployed last autumn, 2019, which allowed people to then move money again from this escrow. So we gave them 20 bucks each and they could move it into these smart contracts. Here, what you're watching is someone will build a smart contract with global earthquakes. If an uh, earthquake takes place at seven on the Richter scale or above in Oceana, just Oceana, then with a total offer of about 30 bucks, what they will do is establish a cart smart contract which is gradual, which means every time there is an earthquake that big, it'll pay out $8.70. And they'll do it over, I think, a two-week period in this in this period of time.
and and that's a smart contract baked onto um, the blockchain. So they can't renege, they can't go back on that deal, neither can I and we, and they'll then get a series of notifications as that donation moves out into the world. And I'm just going to show you, this is one I set up way back when in um, last, and you can see I'd established the contract. And just to finish this little talk, um, if you set, it's a learning actually, if you set your contract too low, and I set mine at a, um, a 30 cents would travel out based on earthquakes of anything over, I think 3.5 higher on the Richter scale. And wow, did I learn the hard way. There are earthquakes taking, time, taking place all the time across the planet. And if you put it across Russia, um, across Vanuatu, Chile, they're taking place all the time. And very quickly we found that this particular application operates as a learning tool as much as it does to understand how it changes donation practices. And you can see it flashed out. The money, the money was fulfilled extremely quickly because I set it too low. So that is the last slide. I think I've finished within 20 minutes and um, that's blockchain by design. So I'll stop sharing and look back at your beautiful faces. Thank you very much, Chris. So now we move on to Cathy. I'm glad you didn't make a, a smart contract with fake news because then you will be bankrupt. <laughs> Thanks. So I'll move on to Cathy uh, whenever you're ready. Sure. Uh, so, uh, Chris, I've got a ton of questions for you. This is going to be it'll be good fun discussion at the end. I hope so. Um, uh, yeah. So, hi everyone. I'm Kathy Mulligan, and just let me start my timer so I don't go over time either. I've been asked to be sort of in the middle um, to try and get us from uh, the the art piece through the design pieces and through into the more technical pieces. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about blockchain and the transition to a sustainable economy and how we can try and bring those, those things together. So I, I'm an honorary researcher at UCL in the computer science department and I'm a visiting lecturer in Imperial College actually in uh, uh, the business school. And I am a, uh, an interdisciplinary researcher as in I have trained in both computer science and in economics and that's what I try to do uh, to bring these things together. And I thought I, I just give a little bit of a background about me. I, uh, you know, I, I have uh, been in industry, but I've been in academia, and I've got a, a lot of different things, uh, uh, sort of, that I've done over my life, shall I say? And many people get a little bit confused, but the the core crux <laughs> of who I am is uh, engineering for sustainable development. So I had a trip that changed my life, um, which was I was a researcher on a climate change uh, vessel in the North Pole, basically. Uh, so that was a, a long, long period of time. And I ended up looking out at all of the icebergs and thinking, well, what can I as an engineer do to help uh, the environment and uh, bring all of these things together? Uh, and so I, I studied engineering for sustainable development. And then I realized, well, actually, the only way to get people to take sustainable development seriously <laughs> is, to, is to think about the economics actually, and to make it work for our economic system. And that's how I bring everything together. So that's the, the context of what I'm going to talk about a little bit today. And in terms of blockchain, I've been working with blockchain since about 2009. And I was uh, the co-founder of the Imperial College Center for Cryptocurrency Research and Engineering, a uh, very long title. Um, and uh, yeah, so we, we, we did about 40 different uh, proofs of concept. Um, some of those were spun out into companies, which our students are now uh, leading. They, they got well over 40 million pounds, some of them, so a very successful uh, set of um, interactions. So yeah, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the future, but the future is always built on the past. And I'm sure anyone who, who works in, in the computer science department in the uh, uh, University of Lisbon already knows all of this. So I'm going to run through it very, very quickly. But we talk about data and we start in about 19,000 BC with the Ishango bone, which is the first time that humans apparently recorded counting. Uh, so it's a counting stick, basically. And then we move through, uh, you know, all of this sort of prehistory all the way up until about 2004. And for me, up until 2004, technology, in particular computer technologies, were about um, doing the same business processes that we had always done, just faster, more securely, and, you know, basically um, in a more connected manner. So we, we get, you know, uh, all of the work around relational database systems. We get the World Wide uh, Web from uh, Tim Berners-Lee there when he was very, very young, little photo of him when he was young. 
And then about 1997, we, we start to get Google where we talk about search and uh, you know pulling all of these uh, bits and pieces together. For me, things change in about 2004, which is uh, when we start to see the explosion of two things. One is open APIs. So we get systems or APIs that allow us to access computer systems that previously were behind closed walls. Famous ones are, of course, the Twitter fire hose, uh, building apps on top of things like Facebook, building things on top of the uh, on top of Google products. Uh, and we start to see a data explosion. But at the same time, the other thing that happens is we get the democratization of com computational power. Up until about 2004, we really had a ton of computational capacity, but it was locked inside corporate boundaries. It was locked inside companies, uh, really. They were the ones who could afford to buy large scale server installations uh, and all of these kind of things, right? Um, but from about 2004 onwards, the computational power uh, that we have as individuals, um, you know, starts to increase. The, the laptops start to get really high speed. Uh, your smartphones start to be able to do the same thing that, uh, you know, took us to the moon. All of those kind of quotes have been bandied about for a very, very long period of time. But it's this democratization of computational power that I think allows, the, allows all of the different bits and pieces. And so Alan is going to, you know, he's been working with blockchain since 2003. So he's going to talk a little bit more about the tech. But it was that democratization of the computational power that allows the technologies to be put together in a completely new way. And I, that's my, I believe that that's what gave us Bitcoin, as well as the, 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 the economic pressure around the global financial crisis. So there's an external pressure. We really need to think of a new way to build the economy, but it was the decentralization and democratization of computational power that gave us blockchain. And so, you know, we're, we're all obviously on a new trajectory now that is about decentralization. What does that mean? And, you know, Chris's talk there about decentralization is a lot more complex than we initially think. <clears throat> and so I'm just going to take you through some of the projects I've done and some of the projects I'm actually working on now. So, as I said, uh, you know, one of the ways I approach everything is how can I do sustainable development through my technical work? In 2009, the Rockstrom guys in uh, the uh, Stockholm Resilience Institute re released something called planetary boundaries. And that's a concept of the nine planetary boundaries within which humanity has to sort of uh, develop within in order to be able to survive. If we continue to um, uh, over overshoot all of these planetary boundaries, basically our, our world will, will die. And so what we were thinking about, and one of the grants that I, that I led was looking very deeply into understanding how can we use digital technologies and things like blockchain to actually change that. And, uh, you know, we realized that local interactions can often drive very strange effects across the entire world. And so we wanted to see where technologies at a very small level were going to help impact at a global level. Or is someone uh, go on mute there? Um, so we looked as very specifically, we looked at the agricultural impact on planetary boundaries. So uh, most of you will know that agriculture has a huge impact on planetary boundaries. And, you know, for example, in the, in the um, image to the right here, you can see that the GHG emissions are around different types of uh, food stuffs. So meat is a huge amount, uh, you know, cropland use, blue water use, all of these kind of things are affected by agricultural activity in human life. And so we focused in on something called food hubs, mainly because we like eating. Um, so that's the, the other thing, great thing about research, you get to focus on things you enjoy doing. Um, and we really wanted to look at how we would reduce CO2 for transport, reduce waste, and also look at a, a little bit of an element of creating connection in local communities. And so we brought together a bunch of different people from H HCI, uh, computer science, from psychology, and from economics. And we put them together into a team and we tried to work out how to think about digital technologies in, in this new way. And we came up with the idea of focusing in on the alternative food supply chains. And these are horizontal networks by small scale farmers to turn away from conventional food systems and towards re-territorialized or decentralized food supply chains. 
So we were looking at how you take blockchain to create a re-territorialized food supply chain. So just a quick word here on uh, the supply chains that you interact with on a day-to-day -day basis uh, within food. So all around the world, we obviously have farms. And what we have is then on top of that nested markets, these are intermediaries. You will know them as intermediaries that are uh, collecting all of the different foodstuffs, putting them together in different ways. And then they will put them into the upscaled or the meso level uh, nested market. And you would know that as your, your supermarket. So these uh, supply chains are extraordinarily complex and extraordinarily uh, difficult to understand. They are not uh, easy. And I think one of the key issues that we sort of have in blockchain is sometimes we think uh, the, 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 the things we're interacting with are a little bit easier than they actually are. So for example, if you take your average coffee um, that you buy from a Starbucks or you buy from a, uh, I don't know, Cafe Nero in the UK, there's about 144,000 people involved in the process of getting that coffee to you. That's a huge amount of people. And so how can we use uh, digital technologies to firstly create some positive environmental impact, but also change some of that interaction across the supply chain? And so we, we actually focused in on, uh, believe it or not, edible flowers. <laughs> So why, why did we do that? Well, edible flowers are actually a, a core part, or they were for a very long period of time, a core part of the diet in the United Kingdom. Over time, we can no longer eat our flowers. And the reason for that is that most of the flowers that we would buy in the supermarket these days are from the, the global supply chain. So we did some analysis. There's about a thousand kilos of CO2 for every single bunch of flowers that you would pick up and buy in, for example, a Tesco or ask a, a florist to put together for you. And uh, you can't eat them because they're poisonous. They're also full of um, pesticides, et cetera, et cetera. So you can't, can't do those things. So we worked with a, a young um, company, a micro enterprise. So that in the UK, that means one or one to five people. Um, it was called Pretty Delicious. And she was working to create a supply chain of edible flowers. She basically took that into Michelin star restaurants and worked with them to create uh, menus. And she also, because of her background, uh, had some, some suppliers um, that she, she had across, across the UK. The reason that you want edible flowers as well is they are a waste product. So you, you, you would plant them as a companion plant. So there's environmental impact, it improves the soil uh, and it improves the economic impact um, for the farmer because they're selling a waste product and they don't have to pay so much money for pesticides. The companion plant attracts um, uh, insects to the leaves and leaves the flowers alone. But effectively, it was very simple. So they had a coordination problem, um, which is what have you got? What do I need? How quick can you get it to me? And uh, effectively, we realized that this is business processes, but at a micro level. And so it, effectively, what we did was we created a SAP on your mobile phone and the coordination mechanism that we used so was actually um, Twitter. So we used hashtags on Twitter to say, hey, I, I need uh, a kilo of violets uh, by this time in this date and people would respond with the same hashtag but just saying sell, hashtag sell instead. And uh, that worked extremely well. And the way we use blockchain was of course to track and trace all of those transactions and to ensure that we had a reputation management system sort of up and running. And this really got us thinking, um, you know, it's got us thinking for a very long period of time. Because if we think about the European economy and the British economy, 99% of the European economy is SMEs. That means we have to work out a way to support SMEs in those complex supply chains in order to ensure that they're able to have access to equitable parts of the value chain. They need to be able to have um, you know, reliable supply chain methods. And they also need to be able to have reliable business processes. Uh, if you look at the existing um, sort of uh, things today, SAP, even SAP, um, SAP, um, oh, I've forgotten the name of it, but they have one for smaller companies. Um, it's hugely expensive. 
uh, technology, um, really out of the price range for the, uh, the vast majority of SMEs. And the other thing that we were thinking about, of course, is as you know, Chris also mentioned, is this idea of machines are now going to be able to buy and sell uh, things from one another, but they're also going to be able to buy and sell data in order to create what we call information products. And so through a variety of different projects, um, and this is the work that we've, we've been thinking about at UCL, a group of us in the computer science uh, team sat down and thought, well, what is the future? We've got all of these great technologies out there, uh, sort of, you know, from blockchain through to AI, through to machine learning. How do we bring them together in a way that is really going to shift the dial for Europe in particular, but also these SMEs? And there are some other issues that uh, my colleagues uh, were also quite concerned about. So we created a pretty grand vision um, that we call DataNet. And DataNet for us is to do for data what the internet did for communications. So where previously we've been connecting machines together. So let's say your laptop create, connects to a web server. What we're trying to do now is say, well, actually we need the data to connect to each other in the same way. And it needs to be addressable and it needs to be searchable and findable. Um, and some of the other issues that my colleagues were quite concerned about are the privacy and security of data, are colliding with the issues of ethics and concept of public good. So what is the public good around data and around a lot of these different technologies? Also, um, I did quite a bit of work for, for the UN uh, during 2018 and 2019, uh, looking at something called the, uh, it was the Digital uh, Cooperation Panel. And where digital technologies have been seen as a panacea for many different issues, both in business and society, the increasing monopolization of data, um, significantly companies that are based out of the United States is causing increasing concern around the world. I'm sure you all have a lot of discussions in this space. Um, and at the same time, climate concerns means that the world needs to be better in the way that it applies digital technology. So, you know, some estimates put cloud computing alone, just cloud computing is predicted to consume 20% of the world's energy by 2040. That's an incredible amount of energy. And so we need to be really thrifty about the way we work with data. We can't just continuously pick up data sets and copy paste, copy paste all the time. So data from a multitude of sources is now defining our world. And we are trying to understand not just uh, researchers, but companies, governments at local and national level are trying to understand how to utilize technologies for profit, efficiency gains, but also ensuring growth and, and jobs. So the automation um, issue is, is a big problem as well. So the other issue that we realized is every company is currently building its own solution to data management, including identity, security, trust, and storage. So we created the vision of DataNet, which we are still, still working on. Obviously it's, it's one of those visions that is gonna last 20 years if we wanted to do uh, all of it, but it's a technical architecture, but also combined with that economic vision. And the idea is, we are creating a solution whereby we are enabling SMEs, we're enabling users to share their data, um, but we are also creating a system that allows for cross-border data flows that are taxable. Now that, that, that's a, a, probably a, a long discussion for another day, but the idea is if your, your, if your citizens, let's say Portugal citizens, are creating data and putting that into Google's cloud. Google or the United States is making the money off Portuguese citizens. And our, our concept, our, shall we say, provocation, um, if you will, is that shouldn't the countries get tax for that? Should we not get a tax benefit from the United States, for the amount of data that we are taking, they are taking from, from citizens? Um, and so the idea is that it's a national infrastructure to, designed to build a data-driven economy. Um, so that's to allow SMEs as well as large companies to take full advantage of this, this new world, but also to do it in an economically, environmentally sustainable fashion. So how do we balance all of these aspects together to truly deliver that future vision? We're working at the moment with a couple of local authorities in, in London um, to try and understand how we can use this to create economic growth uh, post-COVID. Uh, so we're working with the, the West London Alliance 
um, to look at that in a lot more detail. Uh, and we are also forging discussions, um, obviously, across Europe. I'm sure most of you have heard of Gaia-X, uh, which is the top-down vision for a decentralized data architecture in Europe. Um, um, and uh, we're also working with uh, some of the um, uh, real estate providers in Sweden, of all places. So um, this, is, this is a very high-level overview of the architecture on the left here. And I think I've finished just in time as well. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kathy. And now we move on to Alan. You need to oh, unmute, you're Alan. Muted. Alan, you're muted. Need to restart. I can unmute. And unmute. There we go. There we go. Um, there we go. So I just wanted to say first, uh, thank you, Chris and Kathy. Um, I really enjoyed hearing the context of why people want to use the technology. Very, very helpful. Um, to amend uh, Nuno's background on me, I actually left Affinity about a year ago and have been working on a uh, uh, financial fintech startup trying to figure out how to use blockchain or something like blockchain to uh, improve the financial system. Um, this talk presentation overview is going to be an overview of my experience with blockchain and really trying to center around the question of what is blockchain? Um, one of the things that I've noticed is that if you ask this question to a group of 50 people, you're going to get at least 55 different answers. Um, and yeah, uh, that's a real interesting challenge in understanding what is blockchain. Um, here, there's a, a couple, a number of things that it might be. Um, and that's same machine replication. It's a list of blocks. It's foundation for future trust. It's an overhyped Ponzi scheme. It's decentralized computing. Um, it's none of the things above. It's some other stuff. Um, there's a million different answers. My opinion at this point is that or I have three parts to my answer. The first is that it's a buzzword. That means I never have to ask the question or answer the question of what is Byzantine fault tolerance good for anymore. I spent my entire graduate career avoiding that question as people asked. And I said, I, I don't know. I understand it, but I don't know what to use it for. Um, next piece, I look at it and I, I see it as a, a gift to systems researchers because the performance bar has been set so low, we can basically trip over it by accident. Historically, we were trying to work roughly in this space by comparing our performance against what you get from a single machine. Um, and now we're comparing our performance against what you get from Bitcoin across 10,000 machines scattered across the world. It's a much easier uh, system space to work in. Finally, and I guess the more serious answer is that blockchain is another name for state machine replication. It's the technology is state machine replication and how do we take a bunch of machines, get them to work together and give us the illusion that everything works. So my, my experience with blockchain started in 2003. Um, that was my second year of grad school. Uh, you, can do, you can do some math there relevant, re relative to Bitcoin. Um, some notable things to keep in mind about 2003 is uh, BitTorrent and Napster were a really big deal. Um, P2P systems in general were a really big trend and motivation about how do we actually use, or as we have these compute power available to everybody, how do we work together to do more powerful things than we could do before? And the idea that we had, or our motivation was centered around this notion that students in university have papers that they really don't want to lose. They have computers that are big, but are with big hard drives, but are unreliable. And they also have unlimited dorm internet. So maybe we could help them out by uh, making sure that their papers were backed up on each other's hard drives. And 
that way when their computer crashed, they didn't lose every, their term paper for the semester. Scientifically, we wanted to understand if we could mix game theory and Byzantine fault tolerance. Game theory being the thing that drove the economic interaction of users and Byzantine fault tolerance being the reliability and security of a computer system. Our answer was yes. And we did this in the context of a system that we called bar backup. Um, I'll ignore the context for, for the name, but the important thing was that at, at the application level, all of the users were sitting around in their dorm rooms and could basically trade, trade their files with each other, use space in the other person's hard drive, and when they needed it, get it back. We had to set up sort of a, an entire economic system around it, and we had to be sure from the game theoretic perspective that these interactions made sense and that users would continue to use the system um, and provide the resources faithfully. Under the background, in, underneath, behind this user experience of, hey, here's my file, hey, can I have my file back? What we had was basically all the users' machines sitting around running a consensus protocol to, to decide what's the next thing we should do, or should we store this next blob on this person's machine, and then appending that to a blockchain or to a chain of blocks. We'd call that a blockchain now. And this was a cryptographic chain, so we knew that it was permanent and it was fixed, and we could then leverage this, the existence of this chain to go back and hold somebody accountable if they dropped a file that they were supposed to have. Um, if you're, this should, or at this point, I think this sounds pretty familiar to all of us because we've been talking about blockchain. This is actually very similar to what Filecoin is doing um, in terms of using the, the, the cloud and the group to store data. One of the big differences or challenges that we had was we did this in 2003 or 2003 to 2005, and we had no idea that we could create a cryptographic coin and try to associate that with value. So what we did here was we built a state machine replication protocol, which is really based on the idea that one machine is unreliable and untrustworthy, but if you have a group that are doing the same thing, you can consider that group to be reliable and trustworthy just the power of numbers makes it correct. The core idea to making this work is a two-stage process. First, to agree on the order of commands, and second, to execute those commands. In the nomenclature of, of Bitcoin or of blockchain, this corresponds to we have a consensus protocol to agree on what to do, and we have roughly a smart contract language and environment to execute those things. And if we have this, we get the view of a perfect machine. Now, if we look at consensus, um, this is a very complicated table. The most important piece is the top row. Historically, we've looked at crash protocols, basically situations where machines can just fail by stopping. There's an academic domain focus on Byzantine protocols where machines can fail by trying to cheat and be malicious jerks. And then the Bitcoin uh, opened up this notion of proof of work and proof of stake. All of these are different approaches to solving consensus, to solving the problem of we should all agree on the same value. The key difference between Bitcoin and blockchain and proof of work is that the consensus is based not on a bounded number of malicious participants, but rather on the notion that some work is too hard for an individual to, uh, or is, is hard enough that an individual can't control the whole system for a long period of time. One of the sort of hidden gotchas in the Bitcoin blockchain consensus protocols that are based on proof of work is that even if everybody is honest, there is still a chance that the system will fork. Um, okay. The, there's one more thing I wanted to say here. Um, as in the, the key thing that Bitcoin and proof of work brought up on a positive front is it did increase the number of machines that you could have in one of these protocols. The big slowdown for state machine replication is how many participants do you have? Because you're copying everything everywhere. That's the overhead and the, and the slowdown point. Um, so if I jump forward through a couple of blockchains that I've built, uh, it's now 2015. I'm working at working in industry, and the uh, uh, somebody in the high, uh, relatively high up the food chain has a bee in their bo bonnet that, um, well, 
if somebody has access to one of the data centers and can physically touch one of the machines in the data center, they can control the entire fleet. They're worried about this because you know, some three-letter three agency could easily get somebody hired um, as HWAPs in the data center and might be able to control the whole company. This leaves sort of a corporate security goal of limiting the blast radius so that this one malicious actor can't, uh, can, can control the, the machines that they can touch but can't reach outside to the other data centers. Uh, to address this, we had two main strategies that we wanted to look at. First was to separate the data across the different data centers and keep it isolated from each other. The other was to use BFT replication to uh, basically to maintain a reliable copy that's accessible everywhere, but ensure that changes that are made illegitimately locally stay only in that context. As we were doing this, we succeeded, but we had to implement Paxos again this was at least the fifth internal implementation of the protocol. Each one slightly different, each one slightly tied to a different application. And we also had to re-implement the core applications that we were worried about because while they were based on, on Paxos before, they were also so tightly coupled into that, that uh, Paxos uh, pro, uh, implementation that we couldn't reuse them without re-implementing the whole stack. And what this really highlights from a technical perspective is a trend across consensus protocols across blockchain that the systems are implemented as monolithic units. The consensus protocol is tightly coupled into the application. The end user economics and Ethereum are tightly coupled through the smart contracts, through the consensus protocol, through the underlying protocols to the point where if you change one piece of it, you have to re-implement the entire stack. And once you've got a system that is so monolithic and so interconnected, that system becomes a legacy, a, a legacy anchor that's going to stop your development moving forward. Now, what this uh, industry has recognized that and is look, working on this in the context of the crash, fault, crash tolerant systems, the simple Paxos protocols that we generally view as a separate uh, lineage from blockchain. But the key piece here is that they're really solving the same problem of get multiple machines to agree on the same value. And what's different is the threat models that you're looking at. Um, looking at blockchain and loosely as state machine replication, we can use state machine replication in-house or in a cloud in order to get reliability and trust in ourselves. So uh, if you're running something on Amazon, Amazon is running Paxos which is effectively a blockchain in order to make sure that the Amazon service is itself reliable. Um, the difference to the blockchain infrastructures as we call it, is that instead of running within a single organization, blockchains, the, the colloquial blockchains are running across multiple organizations. And we're effectively using that replication to get two parts. One is to share data with each other and the other is to be sure that we don't really trust or that the customers don't trust any of us individually, but are willing to trust the group. So the, in, in both cases, the core technology is the same. It's just the environment that we're, that we're running it in and the goals that we're hoping to get out of the technology that's changing, uh, or that in, influences how we need to do it. So jumping forward to what I'm doing now, um, I'm really thinking about the financial system and how do we use a blockchain to improve the financial markets? And the key question that we're running into or we've been um, working through is which blockchain should we use to do this? And the answer that we came to uh, somewhat surprisingly or, or not, depending on your perspective, is that I don't really want to use a blockchain directly, but there are lots of pieces that are very, very attractive to us. Um, so, Looking at what we need, from a product perspective, we need to be able to write the product and uh, have it run, and we want it to run efficiently. Um, smart contracts are a good way to write an application, and Chris and Kathy both have experience with that and have had success writing applications around the smart contract paradigm. But when it comes to the efficiency, we found that they're actually pretty bad. And the reason for that is that a blockchain requires all of the nodes to do the same things, which means if you have a 200 node system or a thousand node system, 
you're doing each piece of computation a thousand times. For our own peace of mind, we want the system that we put up to be reliable and available. Again, blockchain does a very good job of that because there are multiple copies. If we lose, them, if we lose one machine, we don't care because we can keep operating and we're fine. So that's good. Um, the other piece for us is we're talking about the financial industry and there's two important factors that are non-technical that really determine whether or not we have a chance of succeeding. And that's whether or not the regulators will accept the system and whether or not the customers or partners will trust it enough to use it. And in that context, we've, we've hit the point where the or conclusions that blockchain as a whole doesn't really help, um, but pieces of it are very useful. Uh, the cryptographic hash chain that's at the core um, of that what's being produced is very useful for audits and transparency because it makes it clear what has happened and it gives you a, a, a attested history of what happened in the past, which gives you a chance to see what it was and also to find out when something has gone wrong. Unfortunately, the blockchain brings in the operations of blockchain bring in some other uh, difficulties that we don't really expect. One of the pieces is replication forces us to share data. We have to share the data extensively with all of the participants in the system. One of my personal beliefs is that if data is on a machine and I have physical access to the machine, I can see the data. And what that means for a blockchain is any data that you've stored is, should be considered to be publicly available. Um, for transparency and accountability, or for transparency, uh, yes, the data is transparent, but one of the issues with blockchains is that the deployment patterns are not. It's very difficult to figure out who is running the nodes for the Bitcoin network. It's even more difficult to figure out who wrote the code that's being executed on the Bitcoin network. So while the data is transparent, the process and the operations are not. Related to that is accountability. Um, replicate, state machine replication and blockchain work and are correct because all of the nodes do the same thing. Um, we don't know if that's the right thing. And because we don't necessarily know who the nodes are, when something goes wrong, we don't know who to blame. And this is actually the key blocker for many of the right from the regulator perspective is that if we don't have accountability, the regulators can't approve of the transactions and cannot approve of the system. So my takeaways after 15 years of, uh, of working in blockchain, um, basically center around oh, the first one that a lot of the descriptions of blockchain uh, describe a lot of how something is done and spend very little time focusing on what it is accomplishing or what, what you are receiving for it. From that sense, I think the, the most the single common piece of the blockchain definition is this hash of blocks that are chained together. All of the stuff about how we got there or the smart contracts are details of how and that center around that what that we have this chain of blocks. If you want to understand the blockchain technology, there's a really big literature on Paxos and state machine replication that uh, gives you a very good foundation for understanding what is technically happening in the background. There are details that differ around every deployment and around every model and around every protocol, but the foundations are all tied to Paxos and state machine replication. And if you look there, you'll actually be able to find lots of spaces to make your blockchain system better from the technical side. Ideally, uh, blockchain should be a deployment strategy similar to run it in the cloud or run it in house or run it on the blockchain. Each of those environments give you a different level of trust and a different source for why you should believe in the system. Uh, smart contracts um, are good for application development. It's a powerful way to think about writing systems, but there's really nothing to do with smart contracts and blockchain technology. You can decouple them entirely and get, and get the benefits of whichever one you want. Um, monolithic protocols are complicated and systems are complicated. If you make a big monolithic system that ties everything together, it might be more efficient today, but it will become a legacy nightmare tomorrow and you will not be able to update it. And 
And finally, I think the, the biggest takeaway for me is uh, when you're looking to use technology, it's very important to make sure the technology fits the use case and fits what you're trying to accomplish and very uh, dangerous to bend the use case exactly to fit the technology at hand. Um, I think technologists, we like to make uh, everything look like a nail. The challenge is recognizing when we should actually pick up the screwdriver. So I think that I also made it just in time. Um, so I'll pass it over to Nuno. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alan. Thank you, the three of you, for great presentations and very uh, complimentary. I'm actually going to pass on to Rodrigo, who just joined for the first question, and, and I'm going to be looking out the uh, hands raised for other audience members. We had almost 100 people attending, so uh, we'll see. If you want to ask a question, please raise your hand or send a message on the chat and I will try to make you through. Or if you don't have a microphone, please write the question and we will uh, ask our speakers to answer. Rodrigo, do you want to go? Yep, sounds good. Uh, so thank you, Nuno, and thank you to the three of you. And these were really fascinating talks. Um, uh, just to bootstrap the discussion, I'll ask a general question to all uh, three of you. Um, and all of you have worked in, in ecosystems with people with different uh, backgrounds, some of them more technical, another less technical. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, you know, what are the challenges of that? And, and what is your advice? What are the tricks that you think um, work in making those collaborations uh, work? Um, maybe I'll start with uh, you, Chris. Ooh, um, well, look, I... Um... <clears throat> Um, I, I really, I, I really enjoy working with other people. I mean, I think, I think we learn a lot as an academic. I mean, this is why we're here, right? Because we really enjoy. We're open people. Yes, we have our own ideas, and academics are traditionally quite strong at having some of their own ideas, sometimes polemics. But nevertheless, working alongside, understanding how they see the world, um, is really critical to my, I think, to academic culture. So, blockchain for me came along at a time when I wanted to understand more about economic crisis, as Cathy talks about, and, and the environment. Um, and it really seems to be, honestly, in, in, in a career, it's one of the few discussion spaces which have so many different perspectives in, which um, Alan says is, is true, right? You ask 50 people, but because of that 50 people, we all have to do some listening because not everybody seems to understand all of it. I've always thought of it as blockchain's a bit like eight grapefruits. I can hold about three grapefruits at any one point in time, but the other five fall out. So I need someone in the group to say, oh, you mean this? And, I'm, and they always pick up another part of the grapefruit. So in some ways, I've, I've really enjoyed going through different people's eyes, lenses, being in their shoes. And it's more about, for the first time in my career, being a creative, where the artists tend to think they know best, and really they don't. But this is a really good way to seeing lots of sciences or technologies from multiple projects. So I hope that answers the question. Yeah, definitely. That's a great answer. Uh, Kathy? Yeah, no, it's, it's a really uh, interesting question, a very difficult one. So, um, you know, uh, we, we very deliberately um, pull people in from very different disciplines into our teams, uh, much like Chris, uh, exactly for that, because you need to be challenged. And in particular, I always get really concerned about what I call technology determinism, which seems to be this idea that technology is going to solve every problem. And all you actually really need to do is solve the, you know, solve the technology properly. Um, but I think that the key is, firstly, it's to have a structure. Everyone needs to be able to work on their own, but have uh, regular periods where they come together. But much like Chris, I think the obvious piece is working out how to listen, if that makes sense. Yeah. The, the listening is so key. Uh, I can't I can't overrate it enough. So yeah, definitely. Um, and you, Alan? Yeah. Um, actually, so I'm I'm not sure how much there is to add to what Kathy and Chris said there. Um, as I, I'll try try a little bit. I think that for me, the biggest one, in addition to their points, is while you're listening, thinking about how the other person's perspective is guiding what you need to do. Um, a lot of times, I think we're, we're very good at understanding how we're doing something and those outside perspectives and different perspectives give a lot of insight into why you're doing that and what the end goal, what your end goal needs to be. Um, so 
Yeah, definitely. So I think we have a few questions. Uh, let's start with Rafael. Yeah, Rafael. Unmute. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm, I'm Rafael Balshir. I, I, I wonder, uh, so private blockchains so, or permission blockchains, such as Hyperledger Fabric, Canton, and even private instances of Ethereum can solve some of the shortcomings that Bitcoin has. For example, privacy, uh, the low scalability, and so on. However, those private blockchains are considered by the community to be isolated silos. So data and, and value are concentrated in a, behind the wall, right? Typically, those blockchains cannot talk to other blockchains, cannot talk to the exterior world very effectively. However, there are some uh, recent developments in blockchain interoperability techniques in, in which I'm working. How do you see blockchain interoperability as the enhancer of um, the blockchain technology and as the uh, vehicle to adoption by enterprises and by organizations? Okay, I, I'm, I'm guessing that I, I'll jump on this one first. <laughs> um, so uh, I think blockchain interoperability is key for anything to happen with blockchain in the future. Um, we can't have isolated silos. If you look at the, the economic markets today, um, everything works off of many different actors from many different places and technology will have to support that. So interoperability is key on that front, not just with blockchains, also with legacy systems. Um, that said, I think, or, uh, I don't think the blockchain technology is, is or should be a given. I don't think it's the right technology for most, for most situations. Um, and it's not just the scale. It, uh, it does come down to the data scare sharing and the forced data sharing, um, even within the group. So for the private blockchains are running within a group, everything that's on the blockchain is visible to all members of the group. That's not necessarily a good thing from a business perspective. Um, so, mm -hmm. so yeah, as interoperability is important, um, but it doesn't really address the, the core issues around accountability and data sharing that show up in blockchain, as well as the efficiency. Right, thanks. And maybe, uh, I guess, like, I've, I guess uh, I'll go next. Uh, so, you know, uh, so I, I do tend to, you know, Alan is completely correct. Um, but the, the one thing I would say is for the private permission blockchains, you can uh, prevent, you know, there are ways to prevent people from being able to read everything. Um, but I do agree uh, completely that blockchain really seems to be, um, it's a tool, um, much like any other tool that you, you will have in your kit bag. And it's, it's really about understanding when to use it effectively. So, you know, you wouldn't always, for example, use a fully federated decentralized uh, database either. Uh, you, you, you would use your your um, uh, things, you know, you, you have to think through what the actual problem of trying to solve is. The one thing I will say is that blockchain really, you know, I think we're at the really early days of blockchain. Um, and I think, you know, I really believe that uh, there are going to be huge advances coming up. I think we're at the same state of uh, development of blockchain as we were really with databases in about the late 1970s, if I'm brutally honest, we're sort of at that level of sort of stage of development. But for me, what blockchain is really about, and I think this comes back to your interoperability question, is it's really probably one of the world's best thought experiments. I think it's a really beautiful thought experiment that challenges us to really think about how is this stuff actually really defined? Do I really need a central bank? That's what blockchain, that's the power of the blockchain for me. It's, it's challenged the world to rethink how it's structured and organized. And interoperability will be a key part of that, but you know, I think it's more of a, it's more of a thought experiment. Do you want to comment on this one, Chris? We have also no, that's that's a bit uh, it's technical. Um, I, I like the thought experiment, and it might take us certainly to Claudia's question later because I think, I think these are yeah. So I'm I'm going to defer on the the hard ones. <laughs> You'll see this is a regular thing that Chris will do: deflect when it gets techy. <laughs> Do you want to Thank pick you, on, on on Claudia's question? Well, I, I think I think I think Claudia. Uh, sorry. So in terms of Claudia's question around how would you explain it to, I wouldn't. I I think Kathy's got a great point there. I wouldn't try to explain it. I do think there's a really interesting way of introducing 
when we have people walk into our workshops, um, they come from organisations, be it charities or governments, or they come on their own, but they tend to have something that's grinding away in their, their mind. And what we tend to do is just dismantle, or try to just wheel back on the idea that the world needs to be the world that it is now, which is largely imbalanced in terms of fairness, um, inequitable, um, it doesn't represent everybody, it's, it disempowers many, many people. So we tend to start to that and then use, the, I like this idea of the thought experiment, I'm afraid, Cathy, I'm going to stay with it, but then use the Lego pieces as a way to begin to think about how agency or, or value exchange, transaction seems a bit reductionist, but how you begin to talk about bringing different values to um, a conversation that feels that everybody has some stake in it. And, um, and sometimes it doesn't work because the person or the team want to secure something that their business is trying to do, and then it becomes competitive. And then we'll wheel back and say, hey, go and talk to another group because we're interested in balancing some of these things. So we stay with the Lego, we stay with the Geocoin running around the streets to think about how it changes power, how it thinks about how it might empower in different ways. So that's usually the starting point. And those are quite high level things. I, I think back to my parents who are um, 40s kids, 1940s kids, and they believe in state. And I have some respect for state, but I'm concerned about state. But that imaginary of that generation is wholly invested in defending state. I've got me, my, I'm the, the kids and I've got my own kids slowly after these generational groups. I think we're questioning more about state. So again, I like the idea that, that it's a good thought experiment that reflects about many of the questions for this time um, in society. But I'm rambling now, so I'll, I'll shut up. So Alan, you already had 50 definitions of, of blockchain. Do you want to um, try and add another one? <laughs> well, uh, so I guess er, two, I have a two-part answer. Um, one, I think that basically Chris and Kathy's answers and pointers to thought experiment about how how the world could look, I think is for me is the missing piece about what blockchain is good for and how to explain it, how to explain what's it good for to somebody without much tech background. Um, the If I'm talking just about the tech, which I'll split as the other part of the discussion, I, it's, I, would desc I describe it as a, it's, it's a technology for making sure a bunch of machines do the same thing. And that, that's the, the core technology piece. But I think the, again, the points from Kathy and Chris about the impact on the world is the part of the description that I've always missed. And I think that's just a really, really good way to frame that. Kathy, do you want to add your own definition? You're fine. We have another question from Ray. Uh, where do you think will be the main use of blockchain, permission blockchains or permissionless blockchains? And with either choice, do you think this one actually benefits society the most as well. I think this benefit to society is, is kind of an overarching question that many people have about blockchain. Is blockchain and utopia uh, is much more of kind of an imaginary technology future that we would like to see. Who wants to take on this one? Okay. I was hoping Chris was going to take it up. He's like, <laughs> Um, so, so yeah, no, this, this is a really key question, isn't it? And actually, do you know what the, the, we don't actually have a good framework to understand social benefit for technology, uh, right now. And I think it's actually one of the critical things that's missing in the world. Um, so what, what would, you know, how do you actually genuinely measure the social impact of something? Um, I did spend some time now. I'm very happy to share my failures in life as well, guys. So um, I did spend quite a bit of time um, when I worked at some place called the Future Cities Catapult doing trying to work out exactly that. So I was trying to work out a performance and use portfolio, which was what is the economic impact? OK, we have methods to do that. But by the way, you want to measure the economic impact of a technology. It's a 48 page document. So that takes a long time to do the environmental impact. We had some loose ways to measure it. But, you know, it was very difficult to do. And we, we got someone in to develop a, an environmental impact framework. And that was quite, quite complex and quite difficult to do. The social impact was nearly impossible to work out or to quantify. 
And that's the, you know, the, it's a big issue actually in our world. And it's not just about blockchain, you know, it's, it's about what is the social value of, of cloud computing? People will make up all sorts of things uh, in order to try and sell you something, right? Um, but, but I think those frameworks are something we need to develop, um, definitely. Um, maybe, Alan, do you, have you seen anything in this space, maybe? No, I, I haven't. I, but I guess I think, from my perspective, I think the, uh, the biggest impact will be on the thought experiments of how can we restructure society um, and, and the model that it gives us there, independent of the technology platform. Because everything that Chris is doing, it's motivated by the blockchain ideals. But as he observed, he migrated from uh, blockchain one to blockchain two to a web browser and he got it in place. So he was able to reach the end goals that way. For the technology, I think the, I think the future is in permissioned blockchains because that, those are the ones that can be run efficiently um, and operated efficiently and reliable, reliably. I think the permissionless ones are um, socially irresponsible from an environmental perspective. Um, and I think that the, ultimately that should, that will, or at least should um, kill those from being a foundation. Yeah, maybe, maybe I'll just come in. I think that's really interesting because you're absolutely right, Alan. Every time we've done this work where we've gone with some of the, 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 the thought experiment, it's ended up changing entirely the design space for people within it, but we've reverted to basic old digital economic technology. So the Oxchain trial um, with the smart donations will go again in the new year, but we'll use Stripe. So really interestingly, it's, um, but, but I don't, honestly don't think we would have got to, with Oxfam, to develop a, a different way of thinking around donations if I hadn't gone through the onion. So it's really, and I don't mind that. I mean, I'm not, a, I, I, like, I like being open about the failures or the problems, but saying go there, take away what works, and then, and then, then underpin that working with, a, with an economic bottom line or a social bottom line or an environmental bottom line. So yeah, it's been, I, I, I love it. I really enjoy that's what that allows us to do, which if I'd stayed with Oxfam to say, hey, let's do a new donations, we'd have just gone round the old houses. Um, but now they've got something really interesting, which feels a bit more connected to earthquakes, to politics. It's it, it, it's really interesting, but yeah, good good spot though. It usually ends up with <laughs> other tech. We have another question from Thomas, which tackles the the environmental um, cost of, of blockchain, and and there was uh, a common. Uh, uh, word that all of you mentioned, which is value, and the question is: Is 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 you know, uh, uh, power hungry blockchain like Bitcoin what we need now in our society that consumes more power than the whole country of Portugal and basically runs on the social value of speculation? You want to comment on that, Chris? <laughs> Uh, but yeah, it's, and I, I, I mean, for as long as I've known people in this space, and I guess um, from Kathy through um, people, I don't, I think it's always been there as a, an ethical debt that we want to talk about it as a thought experiment, but we have this thing, this, it's not a conceit, but a genuine concern, which, so in every conversation, it doesn't go away. And I think that's really good. I think it's, I think it has cost a lot to do this thought experiment and no doubt some people perhaps don't care who are just running the Bitcoin servers. But for many of those who really do care about what we're trying to do is we perform the experiments, if you like, and trial these things out. We are very, very conscientious. So there is a dichotomy or a paradox with these. Having said that, I'm, I'm hoping my colleagues can also step up and say that it doesn't have to be like that. And unfortunately, it's become a dominant public, uh, part of the public critique, which in some ways blocks some of the best bits of the thought experiment, which is what about power? What about moving this to better represent groups who are not represented in different um, governance structures? So yeah, I'll be curious to how Alan and Cathy take this one. I guess I, I can uh, uh, sort of touch on that now, maybe to con combine it with Jose's uh, question about uh, measuring cultural values as well, because really here, what you're thinking about is what is the value 
uh, that society as a whole places on something. And, you know, the other thing that, you know, blockchain, the thought experiment, and, but it's also a direct challenge to our existing social norms. We, we have a social contract, and Chris has touched on it at numerous points of time, that we have an established way of doing business and working in the world. And I think the, the key thing is to understand how are we going to negotiate that going forward if we are using blockchains? And that includes environmental, social, cultural value. The final thing I will say on that piece is that um, my ethics is not your ethics. Um, I grew up on three continents. So I grew up uh, on uh, England, you know, Europe, Australia and America. The ethical values of someone in Australia are fundamentally different in some instances to the ethical values of someone in the United Kingdom. They even speak the same language, but they don't have the same ethics. Now, here's a really fundamental challenge for you then. Is there actually a universal definition of cultural value that we can actually apply to these technologies? Or is it something we have to engage with and constantly engage with over time? Um, and uh, as I said before about the environmental piece, I really believe we're at the beginning. And I think we're going to start, you know, thanks to work with people like Alan, et cetera, et cetera, be able to see, <laughs> and also Rodrigo, I hope, <laughs> you know, uh, see a, a much more environmentally friendly blockchain emerge once we start to make advances on the tech. Thanks. Alan, do you want to? Um, I, I think Chris and Kathy covered that, covered that one very well. It seems that we have more questions popping up. Uh, João Bell, could stock exchange future be on blockchain as a way to do transactions binded by smart contracts? You want to take that one, Alan? Uh, I have two answers. Um, could it? Yes. Should it? Uh, very much open. Um, if your goal is to use smart contracts, you don't need a blockchain platform to do that. And we have another question. Depending on the application, public blockchains can also clash with privacy and the right to be forgotten. It can make things transparent, but as Chris said, immut immutably can be problematic. More thoughts about that? Yeah, okay. yeah I was just gonna say, I, it was the first question I asked the European Commission when I saw them pushing a blockchain project and GDPR at exactly the same time. <laughs> I said, like, guys, could we have some clarity here? <laughs> I think I think it's really interesting. I mean, as an artist slash designer, I think placing yourself within that question is what we've tried to do. I, I confess, I, people will know I stream my toilet roll activity in the downstairs toilet to the internet because I'm curious about the breach. I've had I've had to turn. Well, two people have refused to go into that toilet because every time I they approach it, I say, look, in terms of consent you've got to know that that toilet roll holder is on the internet and people can see and they're monitoring quite quickly. It's very easy. It doesn't take machine learning to spot a big drop in data when it uses a lot of toilet roll. So I, I'm, I'm going to be the artist on this one. I think it's really interesting to talk about what privacy is. Um, I don't want a state government concept, which I've inherited from the 1940s and 50s. I'd much more to talk about privacy and the right to be forgotten in, in, a, in a conversation. And I think some people desperately do need to defend those rights to be forgotten. Other people are privileged. I'm very privileged enough to say, it's probably unlikely anyone cares about my toilet roll use. So I, I quite like opening the, the box and problematizing it. But I, whatever we do, we must have the conversation as Kathy says, actually keep, let's keep talking about what that is. And yes, some part of your lives, you will want to be immutable. Other times you want to be more open, but it isn't, it isn't the norm. <laughs> Everyone will have a very, very different perspective on what they think they want to hide and what they want to share. And those will be dependent on their privileges or their opportunities um, or their circumstances. So forgive me, I'm going to play the artist, but let's keep talking about it rather than make it a binary, do this or don't do that. So I, I actually, or I think I agree with Chris, but I, I'll take that one step further and say that the if as long as the technology requires the immutability, this is one of the very big points where you have to ask, what are you trying to achieve? And is this technology the right fit? And it's a place where the, again, the idea, the thought experiment driven by blockchain can be very, very powerful. The choice of whether or not to use the technology is separate from that, from that design. Thank you. 
Any last question? Yeah, we have Jose Reis waving. Do you want to ask a question? Yeah, uh, more of a comment on, on the panel to some extent, and it's related a bit. Well, so first of all, I want to thank Technico and Big for this very good start, you know, like of your set of I would I hope to be, you know, like more sessions like this. Um, and it's actually regarded, you know, like to the literacy issues and to, and to relation to, uh, to a couple of, you know, like stakeholders, you know, like that we've been, you know, like flagging, you know, like all along, you know, like the different uh, interventions. And I'm going to base a bit, you know, like on the policy level and relationships, you know, like with politicians, which to some extent uh, are or will be, you know, like the regulations, uh, regulators also in this space uh, and focusing a bit on the EU. Because, you know, like we've been seeing, you know, like Mika, you know, like coming into European Parliament, you know, like the EBSI, you know, like also, you know, like it's taking, you know, like it's on course. Just recently, you know, like the, the, the Digital Service Act, you know, like the Digital Market Act and so on and so forth. So in that sense, sometimes, you know, like they do have the, 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 the impression that not only, I mean, in Portugal recently, we have this famous case with Miguel Sousa Tavares, right? about how blockchain is blocking the fake news, you know, like in its, in its original source. So we do understand there is a lot of way to go in order for the, some influencers, you know, like to some extent, so public figures, you know, like uh, people in the media and politicians as well, you know, like to be duly informed and to be uh, in a relationship with the space and a relationship with researchers, with entrepreneurs, you know, like with startups, to try also, you know, like to be a partner to some extent in what we're trying to build and to try and, you know, like to achieve. So in that sense, you know, like, um, you know, like for instance, also, you know, like some different countries are promoting also their own blockchain strategies, you know, like recently Germany, Australia actually was, was one of the cases here. I really enjoyed their blockchain strategy. Um, the state of California also, you know, like it's trading, you know, like very, very strong, uh, you know, like uh, uh, steps towards this. So in that sense, and when I talk to these people, uh, especially the people who were designing and, you know, like inside the ministries working on this, I always, when I talk to them about the relationship with the politicians, were practically none. Not only the politicians were not informed about, you know, like the technology role, and they had, you know, like huge, not problems in themselves, but uh, one of the main gaps was this, this educational problem, this educational gap, you know, like the literacy issues. Um, you know, like I, I took from Chris, you know, like a lot of, you know, like very good pointers, you know, like from the, these practical, very visuals uh, and very engaging, you know, like workshops that I think, you know, like took a lot, you know, like of feedback, you know, like from the people involved. But sometimes academics and sometimes, you know, like entrepreneurs, we are focused either on the research or on the business, you know, like they're trying to achieve or we're trying to, you know, like to set up. And sometimes, you know, like this interaction and the feedback from the interaction can be something that, you know, like either we don't have the time, you know, like, or, you know, like something that regards. So I wanted, you know, like a general overview. How do you think we can, you know, like, um, you know, like uh, uh, not only mind the gap, but, you know, like close this gap, you know, like and to engage, you know, like some of these, in my point of view, you know, like important, you know, like stakeholders and bring them more, you know, like closer to what we are trying to do. Thank you again. Thank you, Josette. The question included a, a, a private joke to our, to, to our panel about uh, a local TV celebrity who said that uh, blockchain is going to solve the problem of fake news by blocking the chain of fake news. But uh, sorry, guys, please go ahead and comment, Chris and Alan and Caitlin. Well, I need, I, need, I need to say that things like meetups and conversation, I know Edinburgh's um, really interesting in 20, um, I think 2015, we had the Bitcoin meetup. And then by 2017, it was the blockchain meetup. And now we have a decentralized uh, meetups. And it, it's really great just taking different people. If you can find the right vocabulary, you'll get that thought experiment and you'll get literacy if you like lifting. Um, and I wouldn't uh, put it into silos. So personally, I think meetups have been brilliant in, in my ecosystem. The meetups, interestingly, actually in Zoom, the meetups have been even better because my designers who feel very intimidated by technology have been attending AI meetups because they don't have to put the camera on. They don't have to look like they could just sit at the back of the Zoom and their literacy is going through the roof just because they're taking part in meetups. So it's only one suggestion, but if you want concrete suggestions, look up the meetup culture and see if you can move it to be more open, to involve preferably politicians. 
Yeah, in London, maybe we have a slightly different uh, uh, sort of uh, situation, whereas uh, too many politicians are too interested in blockchain. <laughs> yeah. um, and actually, we, we've had, you know, so for example, you will see that there has been a lot of discussion into this uh, select committees. Um, there was the UK chief scientific advisor uh, organized a uh, report that was specifically for training ministers and, uh, you know, um, the civil service um, and uh, been lots and lots of discussions and actually um, the, the, the nanosecond after the, the Brexit election was held, uh, there was the suggestion that blockchain should be used to secure our borders. So, you know, maybe they could have stopped that fake news. That would have been useful, Rodrigo. Um, but uh, so, um, you know, and we actually have a guy called Chris Holm, uh, who is very actively, um, he's, he's one of the Lords, is actively pushing that quite a lot. Um, I would say that what you need to do is get into uh, to discuss with whoever is the scientific advisors for the government, because once they they understand that this technology is starting to have impact on the regulatory environment, uh, they will they will want they will want to, to know what's going on. So that's my recommendation. And I, I guess uh, so or my recommendation or isn't much of a recommendation. It's more of a question of should we try to engage them. Um, and in some sense, I think uh, a big one of the big things that's happened is too many politicians, too many people are engaged in the wrong questions, um, and from a place where they're they're interfering in ways that they we'd be better off if we could get them to stop engaging. Um, but I also think that, as Kathy said, when uh, when it becomes clear that the technology is bumping into the regulator, and when the thought experiment is starting to change how the regulated activities are taking place then the right people will be in place. And our goal ought to be to make sure that we're explaining it clearly and not selling the, the silver bullet hype and being more realistic about what is there. Okay, I think we should close now. So I want just to conclude by thanking all of the audience. This was uh, a very participated, very lively discussion and special thanks to our guests, uh, Kathy, uh, Alan, Chris, thank you so much. All of the talks and all of the discussion was really insightful and fascinating. Thank you so much for your participation. So I hope everyone enjoyed it and uh, let's uh, all keep in touch. I hope that uh, throughout this project, we have more um, opportunities like these to um, exchange ideas. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, folks.